this I'll be hitting. Uh, no cursing is gonna be hard for me. I'm the I'm the uh, daughter of a sailor. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm probably your dad. That's cracking me up. <laughs> All right, I got any confirmations on Discord that anyone's being that anyone's late. I think everyone that wanted in the squad is in. Is Bravo full? Uh, three spots nope. left. Okay. You can just let me know. Well, there's Kelder. He just logged on. He might join. Hey. Oh, there he is right there. He's in the <laughs> squad. Let's go ahead and just form a Charlie squad to be safe. Uh, Lightning, why don't you set that up for me? Sure thing. Nothing fancy. For a description, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Description, SKL leadership training. Sure. Alright, give me one second, and then we will start. Final reminder, SKL, leadership training starting now. All right, Charlie, set up. Thank you. All right, everyone, park the Colossus. Let's not have anything too close. No vehicles rumbling around because this is being recorded. Welcome to leadership training number three. Uh, for any of you that don't know, my Wednesday trainings are literally just like a leadership training 101. Introduction to leadership. Um, I'm going to go over some very basic things. And then if anyone has any more like complicated concepts or questions, you're free to bring it up in the Q&A. Uh, I ask that questions be held until the Q&A unless they directly like correspond to whatever I'm talking about. With that in mind, let's get started. So I'm going to briefly go over the hierarchy in SKL because there is a little bit of confusion about that. And before I start rambling off for a while, are my comms sounding good to everyone? Uh, yep. Great. Sounds good today. Let me know if that changes because it does often. <laughs> yeah, and Frozen, just before you continue, guys, if we do have any new players here who don't know how to deal with comms very well, if you press plus or minus on your numpad, you can increase or lower his volume. So go ahead and do that if you need during training. Yeah, and I can't be loud sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good tip. On the, If you hit enter on the numpad, which some people accidentally do all the time, it mutes whoever's talking. So if you ever just can't hear someone who was talking and you speak, right, you probably accidentally mute while they're talking to un... Oh, he's going out. I think he's yeah, pushing the button to show him. cutting off a little bit. Okay, well, I'm sure you probably got the gist. Just don't mute people, was the point. Yeah, I think he was manually doing it. No, sadly. That, that would have been poignant, but no, it was an accident. Yeah, I'm giving you credit already. <laughs> All right, so, SKL ranks. Now, uh, most of you know Legionnaire. Legionnaire is the recruit rank. Anyone who joins SKL is a Legionnaire. Uh, above Legionnaire is the Broodlord, which is what many of you probably are or are about to be. Broodlords are platoon leads in training. Uh, Broodlords are the people that are going to go through the academies, uh, the Officer Academy first, to learn basic leadership skills, like I'm in more advanced ones. Um, Broodlords uh, are probably the ranks that you will spend the longest at because they're kind of an intro to leadership rank. Uh, beyond that is the Swarm Lord. Uh, Swarm Lords are the advanced platoon leads in the Legion. They are the veteran platoon leaders. Think of them like the veteran sergeants. Uh, they don't really into administration. They just lead platoons. They're, they're, if you're a Swarm Lord, you're expected to be the best of the best. Above that is Abathur. And Abathurs are experienced or, uh, veteran swarm or uh, people that were swarm lords that got promoted to take on certain administrative roles. Uh, meaning, like, for instance, I'm an Abathur. 
I one of my roles is I do these trainings. I have a vested interest in training, you know, if Legion. Uh, so, you know, I have I spent a good chunk of my time looking for legionnaires that will be good brood lords and, and et cetera, et cetera, and making sure their training goes well. So if any of you all ever have any questions regarding leadership or any problems you have in your platoons that you know I might be of help of, feel free to DM me on Discord or find me in game. Um, and then above Abathur are Cerebrates. Cerebrates are basically the elite elite command of SKL, the people that have been in it the longest, the people with the most uh, responsibilities. Uh, Orby over there is a Cerebrate. Uh, the only people above the Cerebrates are the Overminds, which currently the only active Overmind is Uber right here in the back jumping up and down. Uh, he, he is the leader of SKL. And that is the, it's, it's pretty simple, but a lot of people get confused. That is the hierarchy of SKL. And each of those ranks will give you different degrees of armory permission. Uh, Broodlords have access to anvils and all modules so have access to pretty much else. Pretty much, I think even Legionnaires can craft a bastion piece. All pretty simple so far. Now, very briefly, for any of you who are brand new to the game, I'm going to go over how to set up a squad. Now, has anyone here has anyone here never set up a squad before? Uh, I have not. I've never done it. All right. Okay. So I'm gonna use Zasha as a as an example. So Zasha, I'm gonna bring you into Delta Squad. Now, if you hit uh, any of the keys, it'll bring you to the menus, and then click on the social tab. You'll see the platoon, and underneath all where it lists the platoon, you see recruiting options. What you want to do is you want to turn the squad off of private, go down to the description, uh, disable recruitment, and then type something into that description box and then enable recruitment. So in this case, you would write SKL leadership training. And once you have, once something is typed in there, it's not private and you have clicked enable recruitment, that squad can now be seen from anywhere, uh, anyone in the squad finder. Okay. Now, would uh, who who else hasn't done it? I want I want everyone that have that hasn't done it have a chance Duck to do it. They haven't. Yeah, the duck. Okay. So I'm gonna take Zasha out of Delta, and this will just get rid of Delta Squad. And now I'm gonna put Chad the Duck in there. And Chad the Duck, you just go to the platoon thing right under that. Click the squad off of private. Disable recruitment. Type in SKL leadership training, and then click enable recruitment, and the squad will be visible. I have a question. Can you view the uh, squad without leaving the uh, platoon, like the squad description and all that stuff? Mm, no, you can't, and that's where a lot of the awkwardness comes in. I, I, and you know, this is not just a new player thing. I have ran a squad for several hours and then been told that it has been locked. So yeah. it, it, yeah, it is not just a, it's not a new player thing. You can forget to uh, make a squad not private, or you can forget to type in a description. If you do one or both of those things, the squad will not be visible. And it's not readily apparent to you that that is happening until someone tells you, hey, I tried to join the platoon and I couldn't see your squad. I did notice the squad will show locked or unlocked right above the name, like the squad type, like Bravo Squad. Yeah, uh, yeah. So let me let me lock, or I actually can't lock. So if anyone can lock their squads or disable recruitment, you, maybe you'll be able to see the lock up there. That's that's a way to tell, but it's something that a lot of people forget. But yeah. we won't spend too much time on that. Very basic stuff, but, I mean, even veterans will forget to, uh, to make their squads not private or enable description. So anyone who needed that little bit of comfort to know how, there you go. But so moving on, uh, when you move, when you do the, the squad descriptions, and a lot of the things we like to focus on here in SKL is like the new player experience. So like, we want someone to be able to just find the game randomly on Steam, download it because it's free, and check it out. And if they log on and choose Vanu, and they just randomly get slotted into an SKL platoon, we want those people to have a good time, have a good experience. So that means that we want all of our platoon leads to be some level of friendly to new players uh, an example of which is just to make sure your squad descriptions are not too confusing we like very simple things like skl public platoon 
Um, a lot of people will hear. I'll put my squad tag in platoon chat just so people. Yeah, like what Orby just posted. You can also customize things like I just did that. That's my personal uh, platoon tag. So if, if you see a platoon running around and I am leading, all of the squads will probably just say SKL Frozen's Punishers with the with you know the color fonts, and um, as long as it says SKL and it's nothing offensive, people will uh, immediately recognize. Oh, okay, that's an SKL platoon. If a new player joins the platoon, you want to be very clear as to what's going on. You want to explain things very clearly, uh, and we'll go over that a little bit in the future. Uh, as far as being a yes, it is a, as long as or as far as the platoon descriptions go, just bear in mind if if you are in a platoon and you are not the platoon lead, and the platoon leader asks you or asks someone to form a new squad, onto you to ask them what you would like the like the tags to be. Um, you, you, it's not really our style to hijack a squad from someone. So like if we are running. In an SKL platoon, don't put your personal tags or don't put whatever you feel like putting. Ask the platoon lead what tags they would like for the squad because it is their platoon. And if they say whatever, then you can put whatever. But a lot of the times they'll say, oh, yeah, uh, I'm going to paste it and and, yeah, and you can just there. And for any of you that don't know, if you unlock your mouse and go up there, you can highlight anything that's you not being paste off of it. Yeah, Frozen, from time to time you're cutting off. So if yeah. you do cut off, I'm going to let you know and you'll repeat what you just oh, said. Yeah, that's that's total, that's what I want because the mics in this game suck. Uh, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Yeah, so you can copy-paste things from the chat window in the top left. That was the last thing I said. Yeah. If the uh, mic starts jumping out, I'll uh, just start jumping up and down or something. So yeah, we'll yeah, jump or just kind of follow the mics or whatever and I'll pause. This is my fourth training, so I'm used to this by now. All right, moving on. Uh, does anyone have any general uh, questions regarding like the like squad, how to form a squad, or how to form a platoon, or anything like that? It's pretty simple stuff, but I want to make sure all the new players understand. Uh, right. General question: Font color is just a uh, standard hacks, right? That you can get from Chrome. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, it's a RTB hexadecimal failure. Yeah, you can just look them up. Someone yeah. just blew I'm, all of us up. How did I see that coming? Mm -hmm. It was actually the first time something like that has happened. I just realized my mic was off, so you missed a whole bit of splat. But this is the only warning you're getting for doing that. No more bullshit. Alright, anyway, back to it. Drop in the mines in SC4. Let's be yeah, honest. guys, guys, let's quit that. Frozen, step away. Let let me blow up this these ones right here, and let's not do that anymore, guys. Come on. It's funny until someone has a ruin up. Yeah. Okay. Now, Frozen, just just to add one quick thing to that, guys. As you said there in platoon chat, that is the like standard SKL squad description, the one that says SKL public, uh, new players welcome. That is the standard one. I recommend that if you are thinking about leading platoons regularly, just make a quick notepad archive in your uh, just in your phone screen and keep that description in there. So it's real quick for you to just grab that, copy and put on your squad description, and send it to your squad leaders. Yeah, and there's also a tab on the Discord called PL Quick Resources that you can find that has all of these on there and a lot of guides regarding general stuff. I would advise you to check out. That's why I get. That's why I got a lot of the generic uh, tags before I made my own. It's just you, you. You can find all of these tags on there. I'll give you a good shot. Anyway, moving on. Uh, let's see. So, uh, a lot of the things that uh, we like about our leaders in SKL is a, a good degree of variance. So, when whenever we do these leadership trainings uh, of any variety, be they advanced or lesser, just remember that your style is your style. Um, the only thing we really expect from SKL members, uh, leaders especially, is just a, a, a degree of, like, new player friendliness and also uh, you carry yourself at least enough to where people aren't reporting you for saying inappropriate words or anything like that. Just be respectful to everyone in the platoon. Uh, as far as your play style goes, you can be as casual or as try-hardy as you want. It really just kind of depends on your preference when you're leading. So 
don't let anyone tell you that what you are doing is wrong from the standpoint of how you are playing the game. Uh, if you are running the platoon and if you want to just go, you know, run around in a harasser uh, ball or, you know, do max crashes all days or just stay up in the air, that's up for you. That's up to you to do. And anyone who does not want to participate can just leave the platoon. So don't let anyone browbeat you into how to play the game. There's no right or wrong way to play. Um, as long as you are being respectful and explaining things to newer players, you are in line with what SKL expects from you. Now, moving on. I want to go over the armory real quick because a lot of people see the armory as a bit of a boogeyman. So I'm going to go over that real quick. If you guys will just go to the outfit tab and go to the armory. I'm not going to go over all of it, but I'm going to go over the basic stuff that you all will have access to. So if you go to the armory, you look all the way down, you'll see at the very bottom there is something called facility modules. And those are super simple. All you do is on any map that isn't VR training, you right click from the map screen on the one of the hexes, and you just go down to armory assets and you do one of the modules. And most of those modules will just give everyone a discount for that type of vehicle in that hex that you are um, I would advise anyone who is a Broodlord or a Swarm Lord, or, or if you have access to these modules, use them as much as you like. Quick question about the modules. Can you put them on territories we're heading that we don't actually own? No. No. It's only friendly territories. They just apply to the vehicle terminals at the base. Can Legionnaires do modules? Uh, no, but uh, Broodlord's a pretty easy rank to get, so if anyone, uh, if you are a Legionnaire and want a Broodlord, all you simply have to do is go to the Academy News section of the Discord and opt into the application. It's just a br very brief application you have to fill out, and then you'll be approved within a day or two and become a Broodlord. Gotcha. Yeah, Poncho just got you the form itself. That's the link to the form, and I just got you the Discord link if you're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. Poncho's thing in the platoon chat is the yeah, is the actual application form. But yeah, Broodlords have access to the modules, and I understand if you have some trepidation about using the anvils, but I would highly suggest you just use the modules as much as you need. Um, they they help everyone in the hex that you are coming from, or fighting or defending immensely by not draining their nanites quite as, quite as fast. Uh, the discount is, is very substantial, and green resource is the most plentiful one in the game. You would have to try, you and several other people would have to try all day, every day, for us to run out of modules. So don't worry about placing modules. Modules are easy. And yeah, and make sure you replace what you use. Also bear in mind the modules build in pods of five, so whenever we're down to 55, just build once and it'll be back up to six. I rarely see the module count. Uh, so, Rosen, not, Rosen, you cut off. Go ahead. Yeah. Go again. I rarely see the module count go under 40. So use the modules as much as you like. As far as the anvils are concerned, they're a little bit trickier. Um, the light anvils, you can right click on any any place on the map, even, and either draw, drop a light, medium, heavy anvil. And Broodlords can do this. Uh, light anvils have flashes. You Were you about to say something? Brother. Okay. Light anvils have flashes, and I guess javelins, but that doesn't really matter. Medium anvils have ants, lightnings, and harassers. And heavy anvils have sunderers and mag riders. Unless you are running a very niche squad, I would guess that 95% of the time you are dropping a heavy anvil for a sunderer. And I know it can be scary to do. They're really easy to be, to be shot out of the air. They're really easy to be destroyed. But bear in mind, the green resource is very common. And as long as you're not dropping three unsuccessfully in like a two-minute span, you're free to mess around with the anvils a bit. The heavy anvil in particular, you can drop a sunderer in very, very weird and interesting locations, like straight down the middle of an elevator shaft or on like a rock face that you never could have dro driven it to, or on top of a building on many of the bases. Um, 
one of my favorite maps, maps is uh, Amherst, and Arex's Firearms Corps is completely changed by the fact that you can drop Sundays from anvils on top of the buildings over next to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you're free to Google any of the Sunder spots if you like, uh, or just find them out on your own. My main point is, you don't have to find the perfect spot, but you do need to get comfortable with the anvil. They're very important. So if you are a broodlord and have not yet dropped an anvil, especially late at night, just mess around with them. It's not going to break our bank, and it's not yell at you for doing it. Uh, moving on is the Swarm Lord stuff. So Steel Rain, Citadel Shield, Orbital Strikes. I'm not going to go over them too much other than that. If you ever do have access to a Citadel Shield, it might seem really weird to place. But if you place a personal waypoint anywhere on the map and just it, it shows you how far away you are from that personal waypoint, and just bear in mind that the edge of the shield is 75 meters across. So if you walk 75 meters away from your personal waypoint and then drop the shield on yourself, that, that waypoint is going to be where the shield is. Just bear that in mind for the future. Orbital strikes are pretty self-explanatory. Steel Rain, I love Steel Rain, but it's very niche. Uh, I would not suggest using it for anything other than a laugh or, like, very desperate situations. Any questions on the armory before we move on? Yeah, can you go over, uh, like, target uh, weights? Yeah, so the, the weight in the armory is uh, something that usually the Abathurs and Plus uh, really kind of you know, worry about. But um, if you look... But yeah, just because, like, right now we have, like, ten light anvils, I'm just wondering what, what, uh, yeah, that's are you guys no I, I would probably guess that someone who built those anvils thought that they built one at a time and didn't realize they were building two pods of a lot. Um, so, this is a situation where I would highly suggest you all, if you all see nine or even five an light anvils in the, in the armory, you're doing us a favor by getting rid of them, because they're weighing us down. Not by much, but by a little. And all they do is drop flashes. So, in the instance of that, yeah, you just drop some anvil. Someone's already doing it. But yeah, drop it. Feel free to drop a light anvil if you guys want to mess with that. Uh, as long as we don't go below like four. Light anvils you usually don't see any of in the armory. Well, generally speaking, we like to have like 10 to 15 weight free. Maybe 25, just in case we. In reference to light anvils, I'm a base hunter. I utilize them as decoys. That's pretty much the only need for them. They also, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you have a core bomb, you can re-up your core bomb with any anvil drop or any uh, anything you grab from the base. It automatically re-ups your, your stuff. So that's a good that's a good fact. I didn't know that. Yeah, light anvil craft super, super quick. So the weight is not something I would really worry about. We don't really like there to be a lot of light or medium anvils. Somewhere between three and five heavy anvils is preferred. Um, you know, three, like, late at night, five, uh, like, really Saturday nights, you know, prime time type stuff. But just watch the weight. It, it's it's not really something that is, is for you guys to worry about. But, yeah, we definitely don't want a ton of light animals in a... Frozen, you cut off again. We don't really want a ton of light or medium animals. But, but otherwise... The swarm, the, the Abathurs Plus will manage the the weight of the like and all and yada. And the modules don't cost any, don't do any weight, so you don't have to worry about them at all. Just use them, build them, whatever. Okay, moving on real quick. I'm gonna go over just a couple general leadership uh, etiquette type things, and hopefully my mic helps me here. I'm gonna bring up the sheet real quick. Okay, Frozen, while you were doing it, uh, just so everyone here is aware, guys, uh, with the Officers Academy rollout, uh, I have decided to make a test outfit in the PTS, that is the player test server. If you guys are not aware, PlanetSide 2 has a, a, another dedicated server specifically for testing the updates. And uh, on that test server, everything in the armory costs just one of each resource and they build with within one minute. So I have that outfit set up so you guys can like test anything in the armory. So if any of you guys wanna join the PTS, 
join the outfit in there and drop a bunch of Citadel shields to test it out, drop Orbital Strikes, or even drive a Bastion for the first time just to get a feel for it, you guys can go ahead and do that uh, on the test server. Just come look for me on the Discord if you want to get the perms in there. Uh, yeah, you, you guys can drop as many anvils, as many Citadel shields, just use anything. Yeah, yeah, very good, yeah. Definitely join that if you want. All right, got my document up. All right, so this is just a couple tips and tricks, not tricks, but, you know, just a couple pieces of advice I would give you just from my time as a platoon lead. I know a lot of people would agree with this. Um, it's very basic stuff, but I feel like it's stuff that needs to be said that, that would just kind of help you in your experience as a platoon lead or a squad lead. Number one, most important thing I, I could give you guys, and I know it's hard, but be positive. I, you are going to run into problem people. You are going to run into bad alerts. You are going to lose. It is going to happen. Being negative about it or being defeatist about it is not going to win you any favors in the eyes of your platoon. Uh, it is always a good idea to be positive. It's always a good idea to shape everything in a, in a way that makes it look as good as possible. If we are losing an alert, don't say, guys, we're going to lose this alert. Guys saying, say things like, they're going to have to drag this alert from our cold, dead hands. So they're going to have to take every single base from us, and we're going to fight and fight and fight. You know, just kind of keep the hype going, because there's lots of alerts throughout the day. I can hear you. And if you kind of keep that fighting spirit, that positive fighting spirit going throughout your platoons, people will stick around even through losses. Uh, the other, the next thing on the list that I have that is something I practice that I think uh, helps, especially with new players. Whenever you give an order to either your squad or platoon, give it twice. Uh, not slowly, but in rapid succession. This way, it gives the new players time to understand what you're saying, and it gives your mic ch a chance to do it over again if you're me. <laughs> copy so, that, copy that. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the times I'll say, okay, everyone, hit you, we're going to the Bastion. Okay, everyone, hit that U key, we're going to the Bastion. And just saying it twice gives the new players a chance to hit the map screen, look, for, what, what did he say? Oh, oh, the Bastion, and then find it on the map. And it gives your mic a chance to say something twice. <laughs> and not everyone has a bad mic like me, but you never know. I feel like that uh, adds a little bit of uh, in, a bit more of an informative streak to the to, put, to the platoon, and kind of helps people understand what is going. On. The next thing that I have is uh, something that I've kind of underlaced this with is just be informative. Um, it's easy for us to say put baby gates around the router, but some people might wonder what a baby gate is. So you not so. Just every now and then, try to think about what a new player would experience. So, it is like every now and then in a lull in the fighting, if you guys are at split peak pass and it's literally 99% of the pop is you, maybe say, okay, guys, we have a lull in the fighting. Uh, we're just taking this base. Does anyone, any new players have any questions? And then... During lulls in the fighting, you will get questions. People will either ask in platoon chat or in voice, uh, question, hey, what's a baby gate? Or, uh, uh, is re like, you as redeploy, right? Or, why are we here? Uh, why is there 99% of us here when we could be elsewhere? That just kind of gives you a uh, chance to explain playing, uh, explain uh, how the game functions, uh, explain why some bases need an overpop just to go through and what stronghold bases are and the stuff like that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, stronghold bases that are on the map, they have like a little, they look like a stronghold symbol, a point base, uh, distinct from the amp or the tech plants. I see you games. Yeah, the U key. I, I, I know some people say redeploy, but I like to say hit the U key just so that new, newer players know what I'm talking about. And if they don't know what I'm talking about when I say redeploy, they'll just hit the U key and trust that hitting the U key they should have been. Audio's tripping. Yeah. Yeah, your thing's fucking tripping hard. I know, I know. We're, we're almost done. Might need to get rid of some of these vehicles. I, 
I'm probably gonna start hosting some of these in Discord just just so that my mic is a little better. Yeah, that would be way better. Yeah, I, I just like I like other people being able to join, but you know my mic's been cutting out on me the last like few training sessions. So, but we're almost done. The other thing I would say, and this is kind of more like a like a take it take it or leave it type of thing, but you will get a lot of mileage out of your squad leads if you keep them in the loop. Um, a lot of people will just treat the squad leads as someone who opened the squad for them. But if you actually have like an active like relationship with your squad leads, form some kind of rapport with them, uh, ask better input on things, occasionally send the that squad out to do a solo job and just see how how good they are at solo jobs. Um, it's it's a, something you have to feel out. Sometimes, in 90% of the time, I would say, with a public platoon, you just kind of want to keep the platoon. But you kind of just have to learn to get a good eye for squad leads. Um, especially if you just start making friends and you have people that you trust to get a squad, a uh, group of people up and running. Just making connections, you know, make, getting connections, making friends. That's what we're here to do. And... Let's see if I have anything else that is new player friendly. Right. So as far I'm not really going to tell you how to play the game because some of you are going to be more casual and some of you are going to be more tryhardy. Uh, me, I'm a little bit more tryhardy when I lead my platoon, so a lot of the way I look at platoon leading uh, comes from that. I will only say that if that generally speaking, you probably are going to want to win the alert, and the good ways to win the alert are as follows. Don't get bogged down in any farms, unless it's a farm you created, and always attack. Uh, offensive timers on enemy bases defend bases further back in the lattice, so if you are unsure of what to do, just make a decision. Uh, this game is so complicated, there are so many variables at play that there is very rarely a correct decision. Uh, you will get a lot of points with your platoon and with leadership by just making a call, being confident, and if, and a lot of the times just being quick on the uptake and attacking aggressively rather than you know spending five minutes hemming and hawing will give you the victory. Um, if anyone has any specific questions regarding specific maps or specific situations that came into, we can go over that in the Q and A. But that's just generally. And I hope my mic came through all right there. I, I'm going to go ahead and cut it right here. We're going to go straight into the Q&A section. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either type them in platoon chat or just, you know, speak. Yeah, oh stay out goodness. of my lives. Your shit cut out, please, and I hope my mic didn't cut out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's like a ghost possessing my microphone just waiting for really good times. You talk good on Discord, but yeah, here it's funky. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I talk to it on, like, literally every other game that is multiplayer-friendly, but this game, it's all very off and on. Anyway. It's a feature. Yeah, it's a feature. Anyone have any questions? Uh, so I've been browsing the Discord, and I still don't see where you apply for uh, the next rank. Yeah. Academy News. The, the channel is called Academy News. That is the channel where we're talking about the academies, uh, and the Officers Academy is the one we're working on right now. So gotcha. Academy News is the channel where, where you can find all the information about the officers' trainings and, and you know stuff that's going to be coming up in the near future. Being part of this right now, is that going to give us access to the anvils or only when we uh, send in that sheet? Uh, being part of this definitely is going to go to is going go, going to go towards us reviewing your application and saying yes to it. So anyone that was here, if you fill out an application, like ninety nine percent chance you're going to go through. Um, you just need to fill out the application to become a broodlord. Yeah, now, now I'm going to go over the applications just as we now, finish here. Then, I have a so. question. I was going to fill. I sent mine in. Or I, w I filled out the application yesterday to become. I thought it was becoming a brewer, but it says like fire team lead, something else, and then it's like brewer to something else. Confused. Yeah, there's different avenues to go through the academy. All of them will get you brood lord. The uh, checking those marks will just kind of give us an idea of where you want to go. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Some 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 people are fine just getting the like the anvil permissions. They don't want to become a swarm lord. Uh, some people don't want to be platoon, platoon leads, they want to be squad leads, 
or you know, or, or fire team leads, I guess, mainly squad leads. But we want to give everyone those options when they pop the form. Okay. But anyone who's I, I was a little... accepted will be a brood lord. Yeah, I was a little confused. You, you might want to elaborate on that just a little, but. I have a question. Is there any um, benefit for mentor squad if you want to run a squad? Um, that's not really a, a realm that I operate in very much because uh, mentor squads can only be up to twelve, and I usually try to run like a, a as close to a forty-eight man platoon as possible. But there are directives that you need to you know do get mentor ribbons for so that there is a reason to do them how effective or important they are uh, i think orby has more knowledge on that yeah okay so uber get in here come close to me guys if you look at me right now sitting on top of the rock i'm using the commander's helmet right this is one of the directives that you can do uh and it's basically the leadership uh directive right this helmet that i'm using right now you are only going to get it if you go through uber has it as well you are, you can only get it if you go through the leadership directives you can go to your directive page and take a look at it and you will see that a bunch of those directives are relatable to new players so by doing mentor squads you will get points towards getting this specific helmet now, as far as you are concerned, if you do have more new players in your squad, you will get those ribbons. That means more certs and more experience for you. And that's just on your personal side game. So if, if you are looking for, you know, the most effective way to get certs while doing platoon leading, I'd highly recommend you to keep all of your squads as mentors. Now, there's also the other side of the coin in which if you just mark your squad as a mentor squad, Every new player that joins the game will be automatically put in your squad. And when you do that, you stop those new players from being placed into a squad that has no platoon leaders or where the platoon leader is just AFK and not doing anything. So by keeping your, all your squads mentor, you are actively helping out the new player experience in the game. So if you do enjoy the game, that's just a way that you can kind of give back to the game itself by helping out everyone that's new and it's coming into the game. Just like Frozen said, help them out from time to time. Ask, hey guys, do I have any new players around? You can just go through your list, see a bunch of low BRs on your platoons, and you can say, hey guys, I, I can see we have a bunch of new players here. Is there anything I can help you with? We have a bunch of veteran players here. We, we want to try to help you guys out. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly that. On the practical side, you get more certs plus the directive that you can do. Uh, but on the other side, you also help out the game a lot. I will jump in and say, so I did it as trying to actually see if I could use it to mentor new players, like legitimately. And I found it not very effective because a lot of the new players that come into those squads don't know their own ass from a hole in the ground. And so they don't know how to respond. You might get out of 12, you might get two or three that are going to actually listen, follow you, or even just kind of like be genuinely vested to understand what you're talking about. The rest of them are going to kind of jump from place to place, go all over a place, not respond and not talk to you and not ask questions. So if you're looking to actually use it to be a mentor, it's in my mind actually very ineffective that way. Your better mentorship side of it is doing it as a full platoon where you have that full environment for new players to come into and actually see what the real game looks like and not mentor squads. Okay, thanks. And, uh, Appreciate that. One, one quick heads up, guys. Uh, sometimes, uh, I and you, if you're doing it the first time, you will get a feel that you can only do mentor squads because you will realize that if you check this, the mentor box, you can't open up a platoon. Like, you can't switch people over to other squads. So that means you need to stay as only a, a squad. But if you are in a platoon, you can just check the box to disable recruitment. So if you disable recruitment on your squad, you can then mark it as a mentor squad. So all you need to do if you want to make your squads inside of a platoon a mentor squad is disable recruitment for a second, check that mentor box, and then enable recruitment again. And you can tell your squad leaders to do the same. That way you will keep your entire platoon as a mentor platoon to receive new players. Uh, That's good tip. 
there's another question I've got. Um, something that came up, I think, during a couple of the alerts we've run recently is the use of max crashes, uh, both offensive and defensive. And I noticed that platoon leads tend to underuse offensive max crashes. Uh, we are, you know, we are trying to take a base and we get pushed off point, collecting it asunder and doing a max crash on there. Any guidance on when you want us to do it and when you don't want us to do it? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty simple one. Uh, a lot of it just be comes from the spawn logistics at the base and the base, what the base is in question. Um, any of the single point bases where you have a good Sunday spawn that is relatively safe is a good candidate for a max crash. Um, but I think, and you'll have to stop me if I'm juddering here, but I think that a lot of the reasons why you just will or won't see it a lot is because it's so variable uh, and that people are just unsure whether it's going to work or not. Let's take a, a, a popular base. Uh, I assume most of you are familiar with the Palisade on Indar. Um, that's a single point base, but the closest Sunday spawns to the south of the A point are very open. Uh, even if you got one as close as possible to the A point, you still have to walk over quite a bit of open ground. So in that situation, it it's kind of a coin flip. If if there's a lot of enemy air, you can't do the max crash. If there are a lot of enemy light assaults up on the roof shooting down at you, I don't know if I would suggest a max crash either. If the area is still fairly clear, and uh, and you think you can make a blob of maxes enter that, that building right next to the A point, then that's kind of up to the individual platoon lead. And a lot of the, tr the single point bases are like that, to where it's just... Depending on the Sunder respond, you have to ask yourself, is this run across no man's land worth all of these nanites? And I think a lot of platoon leads uh, err on the side of caution. Watch that. I guess the, yeah. the next question is going to be about sort of, I guess, when to disengage from a base. We frequently have, you know, situations where spawn logistics are bad or, you know, we get overpopped two to one. Uh, but it's... It's been my experience in the last couple of alerts that, you know, it is still doable to flip a base even in those circumstances if you play it right. Wonder, should we be focusing more on trying to do almost like a B-way strategy where you're out-popped and still... Yeah, that kind of just depends on the individual platoon lead. Um, myself, my general rule is I will give a four or five minutes, and if we run out of spawn logistics that are good... I will look at the map, see if we are needed elsewhere, and if we are not needed elsewhere, I will tell everyone to start bringing up new Sundays. If we are needed elsewhere, I will just base. Um, and that's needed for either an attack or a defense. If the uh, if the attack on Cobalt Comms doesn't work, I might you know shift us over to defend the split, to defend Split Peak, and then once we def Split Peak is defended, we shift back, pull more armor from Crossroads, and go back to. Cobalt comms, you know, type of stuff. It really just kind of depends. You kind of need to adapt. Um, there are a lot of platoons that stay in farm situations with really bad Sunday spawns and try to make it work. Uh, you just need to not get trapped in farms. But it is it all. But if the base is really, really important to take, or if you are up in the alert and you are taking a lot of their pop away from them to just defend a base. It, a farm can be a good thing. Uh, a lot of it just really depends on the situation. Uh, if no base is really threatened and you're up 38% and, and the second place guy is 32% and you are attacking the second place guy but not taking taking the base, chew up their pop. Like They have to throw 48 to 96 guys at you to defend that base. Throw 48 to 96 guys at that base to lock that population into place and they will not be taking any more territory from you. Again, it's it's all it's all variable. Uh, I you just kind of need to be comfortable as a platoon lead, and be able to make these calls on your own. Um, there are I I agree with you that uh, offensive max crashes, uh, for instance, are, are very useful. Uh, I just think a lot of the problem is they need to be called earlier than they are, um, like before the A point is completely swamped, uh, before we're fighting in the hills around the city or around the point on our suboptimal Sunday locations. Yeah, and that's something I was, I was actually going to comment on, not so much a question. Uh, 
I've noticed that the most successful defensive max crashes occur usually at about the one, he organized them at about the two minute to one minute and 45 second mark, and you must leave before about a minute to, you know, 55 seconds if you're going to make it in time. Yeah, a lot of that depends on the base, because some of the bases, especially on Indar, have really long run times, especially for maxes. But, um, yeah, you, usually the, the – if you make a platoon sit on a base for five minutes with nothing going on, their people will start getting bored. They'll start redeploying away, or they'll start just running around the camp or spawn. And the two-minute to one-minute mark is when the enemy is the most decentralized, and we can just cut straight through their numbers right to the A point, you know, like a hot knife through butter. And that is one of the reasons that we wait. You know, we, we build up the tension – increase their boredom, and hit them with everything we can in the last couple of minutes. Yeah, pros, and if I can, I'd just like to add, like, two cents to those two questions right there. Queen of yeah, one, one of the reasons why uh, some people don't use maxes on offensive uh, crashes, and this is actually why elite fits like B-Way and Praetorians hardly ever use maxes to breaching out points is because they can't be revived by resmates. And most of the times when you are breaching a highly defensive positions, what you're trying to do is literally get your bodies to go past a choke point. It's literally a matter of who has more revive grenades and just staying alive, uh, like walking five feet, and then staying alive again, walking more five feet. And you can't do that with maxes, because once they die, they're just dead. You know, doing a breach, a, a dead max is not going to get up in, one like, a bunch of seconds. So that's a, a, a counterpoint to using maxes during breaches. And the to the other one, where you, you are talking about uh, when to leave a base, it's going to depend on the defensive position that you have, right? If you are holding a power building with a router, you can stay inside there against a 70% overpop. I've done it myself plenty of times with mentor platoons. Uh, but it's just going to go down to your, like, individual situation. That's why we, we can't give you a, a good idea in every situation. We can try to give you a rough estimate on how to deal with general situations. But in the end, it's going to be down to your judgment. Yeah, and we're working on a mentor program to where you, you all will have access to higher uh, tiers of leadership to kind of ask these questions to in the moment. So uh, if you – and even without the mentor program, if you are in a platoon and you see other veteran members of SKL in the platoon, feel free to DM them after the, after the alert and just, you know, get some ideas, bounce some ideas off each other on what went right, what went wrong. Um, it, it's a good way to grow. I, I talk to several of the platoon frequently about alert. Or, or just bring it up an outfit command. Yeah, but as, as a more practical tool, guys, we, we are planning on fully releasing the Officers Academy real soon, probably around this weekend. And as soon as we do, we're going to have, like, weekly training sessions like this one, but we're going to have specific ones on practical stuff inside of planning site. Like, for example, I'm going to give one every Sunday, and each Sunday is going to touch in one point. So first Sunday of the month is going to be battle maneuvers, so cleanup crew. Next month, the first Sunday of the month, is going to be max crashes, uh, point breaches, point holds, stuff like that. Then we're going to have one specifically for combined arms, how to do an armor column, how to do an air ball attack out of Bastion. Then we're going to have one about map reading, how to do lattices, how to outmaneuver your opponent on the map. And then uh, one final one, I'm not sure what we have uh, in the schedule yet, but yeah, you, you get the gist of it. Like, we're, we're going to have more practical trainings as soon as the Academy roll out. So that's why we want you guys on Discord, because then you can keep up with all that. Yeah, we're going to be doing a lot more Discord trainings, too, where we're just going to get all of you into a call that want to be get into a call for just, like, 15 and 20 minutes and, like, go over an alert that just happened or go over a map or go over the armory again, like uh, go over literally anything, just quick 15, 20 minutes on discord in and out like type of stuff. So there's going to be a lot of things people can consume the coming, you know, week or yeah, weeks or two. All you teens and your ADD, Jesus H. If you run yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? So you were talking about squad leaders and 
how you should utilize them as a platoon lead. I know a decent about how to let them have their little bit of autonomy, but can you go a little bit more in depth on that? Yeah, and I didn't go in depth because it's kind of hard to go in depth about it. You will, you'll run into two types of people when you say, hey, I need a Charlie squad. Do I have any volunteers? You'll run into someone you know and someone you don't know. And when you're first starting out, it's always going to be someone you don't know. And the people that you don't know could just want the position for the extra certs a squad they could get, or they want the position because they think they know better than you, or they want the decision because they enjoy the little bit of power that have, having control over 11 other people gives them, or they actually want to help the platoon. <laughs> so there is, and, and not all of these are mutually exclusive, but... You kind of just need to get a feel when you when someone is a squad leader. Do you know them? If you don't, then you just need to evaluate that person in the moment. Um, one of the things I like to do is if I, I will just keep the platoon together. Uh, the entire platoon will go from base to base to base. If a defense needs to happen somewhere, and, I, and it's not something, it's like a ghost cap, like a 1 to 12, I might say Delta Squad. I want Delta Squad redeploy over to Cobalt Comms, defend that base. And I will just see how responsive the, the Delta Squad leader is. And I will see how many of Delta Squad he actually can get to that base. And if they are successful, if Delta Squad leader reports, hey, you know, Cobalt Comms is clear, do you have further orders? I will then have the sense that that person seems pretty good. And I'll give them another job. And I will just slowly feel, feel out all of the squads over the course. Uh, conversely, you could say, Charlie Squad, I want you to go to you know, Starfield and there, and you will hit the M key two minutes later and see that two members of Charlie Squad are at Starfield and not even the Charlie Squad lead. That's an example of a squad you probably just want to keep with the platoon. So it's something you kind of have to get a feel for. It's a constant you know, test testing of personalities. Um, eventually, you'll just grow to the point where you will get people that you know and that you trust that will volunteer for these positions. And the longer you're at it, the more, like, fine-tuned you'll be able to make your platoon experience. And it is an experience. Like, it, in essence, we are all content creators. Like, you are creating a uh, curated experience for all 47 people in your platoon. You choose how you run it. Um, I am just here to help. So like a D and D game. <laughs> yeah, it, it very, very much like that. Uh, you're literally. Uh, some people will join. You know, someone like Games is platoon. I think Games is still in the thing. He 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 runs chill platoons. You know, just, doesn't just nice and casual. Nothing, no stress. You're playing the game. Or if you join my platoon, you'll probably get screamed at a bunch to get that damn door in the face. And some people like column A and some people like column B, and that's one of the beautiful things about SKL is the variety. So you choose how your platoons run. I, I'm just here to give you the tools that will help make you more successful. Uh, being Catering to newer players will make you more successful. Being positive will help you be more successful. Um, like watching your squad leads and actually making connections and, and making your squads feel proud that they did what you told them to do and – that they, they want a harder job next time, that is will make your platoons more successful. I see a ex Sorry, or do you have one you want to say something? No, no, I, I was just gonna do a heads up for the question in platoon chat. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah you go ahead and read this since my mic's bad. Okay, so uh Or is your mic bad? No, no, I, I was just typing in. <laughs> <laughs> so, Davima asks, as an attacker, what is the best way as a platoon leader to win a stalemate as a three, uh, at a three-point base? Go ahead, Rosa. That's a difficult one. Um, generally speaking, and this is just a me thing, I like to hit stronghold bases with a two-thirds majority. So if you're if you, when you say a stalemate, uh, that already kind of makes me leery on it. Um, generally, I want to throw the entire platoon at a stronghold base, which is a three or four point base, and I want to ring it with Sunderers. I want to bring routers in. 
I want to put beacons in at good spots, and I want to lock down all of those points before the enemy even has the time to respond. And a lot of the times, and I'm sure you all have experienced this, if you look, if you hit M, and you look around and you see one of your stronghold bases under attack, but there's a 48 to 96 there, and you guys have zero pop, a lot of the times you won't even take your platoon there. And that's kind of the assumption there that I have when I throw a whole platoon at. Like, if you get, if you ring it with Sunderers, you put routers down, you put 48 to 96 there, a lot of the times the enemy won't even come. But if they do come and you're in a stalemate situation, you really have to either A, ask command for help, which command is very, very uh, not reliable, or you're just going to have to start leading from the front. Uh, there are a lot of platoons where if you really need this three-point base and you're at a stalemate where you only have one or two of the points, you're just going to have to amble in, like do a lot of the work ambling in Sundays to, to replace your spawn. You're going to have to do crashes, like Cleanup Crew said earlier. Like If you need that base, just regular fighting and expecting everyone to do it will only work some of the time. You're going to have to say, everyone, ball up on platoon lead. Everyone, get the platoon lead. We're rushing that C-point or, or, or Charlie squad. This goes back to what uh, Serenity was saying a little bit ago. If you trust your Charlie squad, if Charlie squad have been proven to be like the veterans of the platoon fight, say... Alpha, Bravo, Delta, get on get on A and B. We're holding that. Charlie, form up for a max crash. Take that C point for us. And in those times, like, you just kind of have to take a, a, a more firm control of your platoon in tactical situations like that. Or if you're like a Swarm Lord Plus, maybe like a good uh, Citadel Shield or Orbital Strike might help you out there. But even then, a lot of it's, a lot of it's very hit and miss. Uh, Orby, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, if you if you're talking about a three point base, uh, quite honestly, it, again, it's dependent on the situation. But most of the times, if you are stuck in a stalemate already in a three point base, you're better off just abandoning. But yeah, that would be I'll, my I'll agreement. You, yeah, I'll I'll give you a few examples, right? If you are an attacker and you are going to Quartz Ridge, and I'm sure most of you already know Quartz Ridge, if you get to that base and it becomes a fifty fifty, you are never gonna take it. Like, uh, it, you yeah. can take it, there are a few situations where you can take it, but most of the times you're just wasting your time and it's a pop sink. That's why it's so important to take those three-point bases when the opportunity rises. If an alert is at the, its beginning, if you see some base that it's going through, but it's a 50-50, and you have the power to turn that into a 70-30 a 70, a 70, over pop to your side, you take it. Like, it doesn't matter how many people you throw at a three-point base. If you have an opportunity to take that base, you do it. You don't care about overpop. You can keep, you can even keep your platoon in there. That, let's say you're at a three-point base. No enemies came to respond to you guys. And you are just sitting there. Your platoon is doing absolutely nothing. There are no enemies in the base. You keep your entire platoon there. You don't take your platoon anywhere else. Because if they decide to redeploy, they will take it back. So those three-point bases are keys, but if you are stuck in a stalemate most of the time, if you can't get help, just abandon it because it, it's, it's going to be uh, an overextension and you're not going to make any progress. You need to either uh, ride the Zerg to take those three-point bases and just hit it with a 96+, plus to push, to push it through, or you, you need to cap it without the enemies even realizing you're there, which will happen. Both of those will happen. Uh, the 96 plus will mostly happen during prime time if you guys are playing, and the zergs, uh, the ghost caps of three point bases will mostly happen on off times because the other factions are just new friends. They have no leadership out of prime time. Yeah, exactly. I, I would agree with Orby that like most of the time I would probably just pull off of a three point base where it's a stalemate. Uh, as someone po pointed out in or X Lasers pointed out in Platoon Jet. Like I said earlier, if it's a pop sync and it, it's good that you're locking down the enemy pop there, sure, stay. But as far as actually wanting to take the base, you lost the base when it became a stalemate, and you might as well just pull. Um, well, something Orby said that I agree with is that overkill is underrated. Um, if you look around the map and you see that a base has a, a, one of those three point bases has a 50 50, don't think, okay, well, it's already even. I won't go there. Think, oh, let's go there. Like, let's go there and overpop the enemy so that we can help force that through. Yep. 
especially if it's one of those key bases. This this is one of the practical things that you guys will learn about the map is that not every base is the same and a few bases has have special value during an alert. Those stronghold bases where you can literally defend against double your population are the bases you want to hold for yourself. So if you have any opportunity to take those, you you get those opportunities. You take those bases. Yeah, and a lot of the time I'll hop on like very important bases as quickly as I can. Like when an alert ends and we go to another continent, I might say, "Hey guys, before we take a bathroom break, let's all hop on the chimney rock real quick, just because we yep. we want that." And while while everyone's taking a bathroom break, we can get chimney rock. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? We are. Uh, I mean, there's not really a rough time, but. Uh, I do plan to call it in the next 10, 15 minutes or until questions end. So any other Austin questions, as long as it's regarded to you know, leadership-related things, we will answer. No more questions, guys? Nope. Come on. I, I know you have uh, something in mind. It's not super related to leadership training necessarily, but do we have, – have you played the uh, – containment sites and do we have like a strategy for that yet or yeah zasha i can talk about that because i i played i was actually in the sdl platoon that tested the containment site uh, last sunday uh we don't the quick question is no we don't we don't have a strategy formulated yet to the containment site and that is especially because changes are still coming. So we, we can't formulate a strategy for you guys to take a containment site because the facility is still changing. Like just one day yeah. ago, they made a huge change to the base that completely changes how it works. So we honestly need to wait for it to hit live server, like have a few rough days in the beginning until we get a hold of a, a decent strategy for it and then we can start like giving out more uh more specialized information about that specific base but as we said with the rollout of the officers academy which is what we're doing right now one of our training sessions will be about bases so we're going to teach you guys how to take attack plant where do you want to keep your platoon on attack plant how to take an amp station where do you want to attack an amp station then one of the classes will be how to take a containment site because it's the new structure. So you will have that in the future. Right now, no, we don't have anything yet. Yeah, it, it's kind of, and as far as strategy is concerned, it's kind of weird because, like, I, I usually don't focus too much on each individual basis. Um, when it comes down to it, it's more is the base worth the effort rather than how do I take the base. So. The containment site might be so much of a time sink that we will just try to encircle them rather than capture them. Or they might be a base that we spend a lot of our time fighting in because it's a very important base to take. There have been so many changes that we don't even really know how to approach them from a strategic level yet. So once they come out and we can actually throw 96 plus into a containment site and consider how much of a slog it is to take it versus how much of a slog it is to encircle it and just cut it off, uh, there's there's a, still there's too many variables, but we are definitely thinking about the containment site. All right, any other questions? Um, yes. Oh. I'll... Yeah, go ahead. So I have a question. Um, a base with SEU, how does it work, and how do you destroy it? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So, uh. Orby, do you, do you know more about SCUs than me? I mean, I know enough, but... Okay, so th there are a few variables on SCUs uh, because a few bases work in different ways, right? So I'm going to give you the two best examples that you're going to find in-game, and those are uh, either you have an SCU room uh, that's going to open up the shields after you hit half the time of cap. So if you are taking a tech plan, for example... Uh, when you reach a certain point with the cap timer, with the capture timer on the base, the SCU is going to open up so you can move in and hack the SCU and render the hard spawn on the base unusable. And then you have other bases 
where it's simply a matter of you getting control of all three points. If you control the three points, the SU is going to open up and you can hack it. A good example of that is Crossroads Watchtower, which I'm sure you guys know as well. So not all SEUs work in the same way. Uh, a good example is the, conta the containment site itself. The containment site has uh, literally SEUs that you can destroy with damage. So it's not even hackable. You get close to it and you shoot it. So not SUs, no, not all SUs are the same. Uh, but the way they work is basically once they are down, the enemy hard spawn is not working anymore. So they, they lose that hard spawn on that on the base. But that's a, a few examples just to give you a quick idea. Most of them either work uh, one or the other. They either work based on timer. So y when you reach a certain point on the base timer, they will open up or it's depending on you holding all three points on the base for it to open up. Yeah, and if you're in a platoon, the, the platoon lead should tell you where the the, the SEU is if he plans to destroy it. Um, there are a lot of bases where it's not as important to take out, like on some of the AMP stations or the big plants, um, the SEU is fairly distant from the A point or from the points. So it can be kind of hard to take, especially in like a very... If you're like close to a stalemate, you probably don't want to split the guys off to deal with it, and maybe just a couple people to take it off briefly. But bases like Crossroads or the Crown, if you take all the points, dive onto that SCU right in the middle of the tower. Um, yeah, yeah. Davima has a question: Is it wise when a map unlocks to first attack the middle or outer bases, or just wait five minutes for the map? I assume for the map to open up is what you mean. If, if it's in prime time, the map will, will open up immediately, but, okay, yeah, so, like, for, like, a, yeah, for, like, an underpop situation, um, if it's late at night, I would suggest hitting the middle, middle bases, because if you do, like, a limited alert, uh, a lot of it will cut off the, the very edges and the middle are where you want to fight immediately at, like, late at night, uh, just because if it does a, you know, unstable alert, those are the only bases that will exist anymore. Yeah, if I may add to that, uh, Davima, that is one of those other things that is highly dependent on the kind of platoon leader that you're going to be. Uh, if you are more of a try-hard kind of platoon leader and you are always hunting for those alerts and you are constantly trying to get them to start and just constantly playing strategically effectively for your faction, then in an open continent, as a general rule of thumb, it is better for you to stay away from the center of the map. Because if you take the bases on the center of the map, you are quite literally stopping the enemies from fighting each other, and you want to keep as many lattices between them as possible. So strategically, say, uh, strategically speaking, in an open continent, the best place for you to attack are on the sides, like the extremities of the map. Stay away from the center, because that way you avoid cutting off lattices between the enemies. Yeah, However, we're talking about the map, yeah. I agree with Orby here. Yeah, however, like, it, it, when you're playing during off time, and there's no, uh, like, there's nothing going on in the continent, there's, there are no alerts, all the fighting is going to be in the center of the map, right? So if you want your platoon to have a good time and just join a fight, the center of the map is your best option, right? So it will depend if you are just trying to give your platoon a good time, or if you are quite literally playing as strategically sound as possible. Because I will send my platoon to the middle of the map after we fight an alert just to get a farm time, you know, a chill time where they can turn off our brains and just go shoot some heads. So it will also depend on your style of platoon leader. Alright, any other questions? Otherwise I'll be I'll start wrapping up. Uh, open up is just uh, you, if you only play in prime time, prime time you might not notice this, but at late at night or if there's two uh, continents up, if you look at it, a lot SME of the map right will be now. grayed out. Yeah, SME look at SME right, right now. That is the second pop. All of those grayed out hexes are uh, not active. Uh, the map opens up, quote unquote, based on the population of people in the map. So if it's an under pop, less and less of the map will be open to fight in. 
So if it's and, the full map, avoid the center. If it's a if it's an underpop less map, then you want to fight on the edges. I want to just add in there as well something simple like spawn logistics. So if you got guys building, um, fucking rotors and rotor bases, if they build them in that fucking gray area, their spawn options to their own base won't work. It disables all spawn options in that area. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. And sometimes you'll fight for a base only to see it become inactive because of underpop. So that's kind of why if if it doesn't have a ch if it doesn't have a high chance of opening up, you probably want to fight where it's safest to be. Okay. Any any last questions or I'm gonna start wrapping up. Yeah, last question. Uh, like, is there like a base that like uh we can look out for that will give out more percentage than other base? You mean like towards like the alert win? Yeah, it'll, you know, we'll give more control percentage if you capture it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, some bases give more than others. The uh, the ones that take like sixty seconds give one percent, and then it goes up to uh, what 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 do the stronghold bases give, Orby? You know, I'm not sure either because it changes. Yeah, they change so it from patch times. to patch. Yeah. Yeah, they change. It's, it's usually just times. a shift of like two or three percent per base. Like it's one, I know it's one percent for the bases like um, like lowland trading and stuff like that. The the sixty second base captures those are like one percent, yeah. and it's usually I think it's two percent for regular bases and three percent for stronghold bases. Yeah, it, it might be like, but there is a system in place. You you can be sh certain of it, but it, the problem is it's not consistent. Like they change it from time to time, and each continent is a different way as well because each continent has a different amount of bases. So values changes from continent to continent. And a good example is if you go to resume right now, each base right there is a very big chunk of the percentage. Right, so yeah. because the the continent is kind of deactivated at the moment, uh, even a small base in there is worth like three percent territory control because there are just so so little of them. Uh, but yeah, there is a system in place. We just can't tell you the exact numbers right now because this this is the kind of stuff that not even like not even us have access to. Like the, there there's no place we can go and check for this kind of stuff. You know. They change might, from time to time. It might help if you if if you read up on maybe the la latest patch notes. They might reference it or something. But in a uh, yeah, it could change on the 16th anyway. So it's kind of hard to gate. Yeah, um, that's true. I you, I just know that I've never really had much trouble with it because you kind of get like an into where the going. Um, kind of have to get yeah. a feel for it. And Davima, the the area in the hex doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter the, the actual size and the map itself. That has nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's the type of base, because there, there's, uh, there's the outposts, which are the bases that take, like, 60 seconds to cap, and are the ones that you can build on. Uh, and then there's the regular bases and the stronghold bases. The game cares about what type of base you capture, not how big it is. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we're, uh, we're running at the time, so I'm going to go ahead and call it here. Uh, everyone, I would... Very heavily advise you to join the Discord if you're not in it. Uh, go ahead and fill out the Broodlord application in Academy Noon. Um, check out the PL Quick Resources when you can see it. And the Outfit Command is where all of the Broodlords and Swarmlords and above can chit-chat about just anything command-related, be it the alert you just did or just a question you might have regarding leadership. Again, there's links up there in the platoon chat. Uh, I got everyone's name in a screenshot. This is out for here today so thank you all for coming i hope you all had a good time even with my mic troubles we'll let you know I, about further things a good point sasha there that the campaign is pushed into the 5th of may now it looks like excuse me yeah, yeah. They, they moved it forward oh yeah. my god again no but yes the campaign yes they pushed it two weeks further uh, down the line and uh, on their post they say that they plan on releasing the update for the new smr on the final week of april so we can wait for it in about two weeks they're going to drop the the update for smr and then two weeks from that they're going to launch the campaign so yeah they're, they're pushing things forward but it's better for them to do this than just launch something broken guys so i mean 
We all know it's still Space broken. Carrots. What are you talking about? It's still, it's still gonna be broken, I know, but not, you know, not as broken as it could be. Bro, no, if you're guys, not using the space broken. carrot background, you're wrong. Yep. <laughs> now, Frozen, uh, I, I will stay around if you guys have any more questions and you want to make them. And I uh, just want to give you guys a quick heads up on a, a few things that are coming up in the near future. Uh, this Friday, this Friday specifically, uh, Sergeant Cody and Jinx are I'm both going to run uh, Flight Lessons 101. Uh, 101. So if any of you guys are, again, new to the game and you want to learn how to fly a site properly or at least get the basics for it, you can join the flight training on this Friday. Uh, on the Sunday, we are probably going to get uh, a big announcement, a, a good chunk of announcement for the Academy with a bunch of dates uh, for everything. Uh, so keep your eyes out for Sunday, guys, on the Discord. On the Sunday, there's going to be something big on the Discord. Uh, on the Friday as well, uh, Vox, one of our Swarm Lords currently, is going to uh, post the first uh, instance of the Orbital Strike news, which is kind of a newsletter that we're working on to just uh, compile all of our information into the same place. So you can always go back to our Discord and look for the Orbital Strike news for all of our training sessions, everything we have scheduled. And starting next week, so not on this Sunday, but on the next one after this one, we are starting the regular practical training sessions. Our first training session is going to be on combined arms. So on the, not this Sunday, the next one after that is going to be combined arms training. So how to do an armor uh, column, how to properly uh, make an air ball, take out enemy uh, Bastions, that kind of stuff. How to properly deploy a Sunder in a base, a few cheeky Sunder placements that you can do with anvils, plus a bunch of very useful information for you guys. So that's just a few of the events that we have. You can find all that on the Discord. As well as the Town Hall coming up in two weeks is also going to elaborate on the things that come out uh, during this month, including the Academies. My next training, like training 101, will be two weeks from today on the last Wednesday of this month. Uh, feel free to come if you want. It, it will be very similar to this one, other than the Q and A. But I gotta get out of here. Thank you all for coming. Not a yeah. problem. Thank you. Go to go to Academy News at Lasers. Academy News. It's all the way up towards the top. There's a form there. Uh, Lord Poncho or Orby could send you a direct link on in tune if you need. Up in Academy yeah. News. Yeah, the Academy News channel is where you guys want to be, everyone. And, uh, guys, I have no time today, so uh, I, I have no, <laughs> I have nothing else to do today. So if you guys have any questions, I can stay here as long as you want. But if we are done with the questions, that's going to be it for tonight, guys. I got a question. I'm going to say that was for Tim. Uh, You're going to go check those. Uh... Farouk, go ahead. Uh, what's the condition for starting the base? Okay, so Toruk, uh, if you go to another continent, you will see that uh, under the name of the continent, there is something called Empire Strength. Uh, like, if you open up any of the other continents map, there is an Empire Strength measurement in there. And uh, if you are on said continent and you uh, put your mouse over that, it's going to, like, show you a scale on that Empire Strength. And basically what that means is... Every time you capture a base, your empire is going to earn empire strength. And when one of the factions hit 100 empire strength, that's when the continent alert starts. Oh. So you, you can take a, a better look at the system itself if, when you move to another continent. So that way you can see the empire strength of the continents when you move there. <laughs>